Also up in Philadelphia, and basically Linda sent a uh, paper to the New England Journal of Medicine, and they said this is nonsense. We don't need it. And she, I met her at a meeting just when she got the letter back. I was editor of the journals of gerontology, biological sciences at the time, and I said, Linda, I will take it because if the New England Journal rejected it. We need really good papers for the journals of gerontology. And she was upset enough uh, that she sent it to me the next day. And basically, we took it. And what she said is, if you have weight loss, 10 pounds in a year, exhaustion, self-report, weakness, grip strength, lowest 20%, walking speed, 15 feet, the slowest 20%, and low physical activity, kilocals per week, the lowest 20%. That will make you, if you have two of the, more than two of those, you'll be frail. And if you have one or two, you're pre-frail. And females basically are more frail than males. Remember, males die more rapidly than females, but they tend to, females tend to be more frail than males. And so this was the beginning of the research onto physical frailty and multiple studies. This is a study that was published in... Uh, uh, Mexican Americans living in the south of the United States, and it shows you that physical frailty uh, is highly predictive of future poor ADLs and mortality. Um, so, with all of that as a background, I was at a meeting uh, in Barcelona, and they there was a lot of presentation by Ken Rockwood and his people uh, giving a list of things that you have to collect to look at frail. And I was sort of thinking about this and saying, there is no way that we're ever going to do this clinically in a meaningful way. Now, I know that they do do this in England clinically. I don't think in a meaningfully clinical way, but they do collect the data. Computers have changed a lot of stuff. But I wrote down frail on a, uh, actually on a napkin, and I said, well, frail must be fatigue, resistance, so I'll climb a flight of stairs, aerobic walk one block, illnesses, more than five illnesses, and loss of weight greater than 5% uh, uh, in six months. And I said, if you have one or two, you're pre-frail, three or more, you're frail. And now there are most probably nearly 50 validations of uh, the frail showing that it's a great predictor of poor outcomes. Uh, so basically, I published it with the meeting, and it came out in the consensus meeting on frailty, uh, mainly because Avalon von Camp. Uh, did not want to offend me. And he had this back and forth with the Rockwood group saying, I'm going to have to put it in because Morley gave it to me and I don't want to offend him. And he could have offended me. It would have offended me very much. But he finished up publishing it there. But there was no validation for it at all. We have to understand that. So Leon Flicker in Perth uh, saw this, thought it was a great definition of frailty, and did a study looking at testosterone and how it predicted frailty. And it really was a very good study. He sent it to the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, and they sent it back to him and said, this is a wonderful study. There is only one problem with it. Nobody has ever validated the frail method. How can you use it? So instead of saying, oh, well, that's terrible. Let me send it to another journal. Leon, being an obsessive compulsive human being, sat down and validated the frailty or the frail scale. And that was the first frail scale at that time. He validated it by showing it was good predictor of uh, act, uh, activity of daily, daily living problems, and then basically finished up publishing in the journal Clinical Endocrinology that testosterone predicted frailty using the frail scale. And that was the first definition. Subsequently, in our large uh, St. Louis African American study, where we're looking at people aged 50 to 65 who live in very great deal of poverty. And uh, we have nine year follow up and now 14 year follow up in the study. But what we showed at nine years is that if we looked at frail and compared it to the Freed study, to the Rockwood study, to the study of osteoporotic fractures, its ability to predict uh, deficits in ADLs 
was basically about as good as any of these, and its ability to predict mortality was as good as any, except the Rockwood one was slightly better. Um, I worked with Jean Wu in Hong Kong and convinced her to take her big database and look and see how predictable the frail will be. And you see here that the frail, both in males and females, was highly predictive of mortality and highly predictive of physical limitations and did as well, if not better, than the other scales that are out there. Um, basically, we need to recognize that all the scales for physical frailty have somewhat poor sensitivity. So they are very specific at picking up people who are getting into trouble, but the sensitivity is not as good. This is the European Male Aging Study, which is another study that was interested in testosterone. And they used the frailty index, the frailty phenotype, and the frail scale to predict uh, mortality. Their participants were 40 to 79 years of age. Uh, and basically, they showed that the frail scale was predictive and that it didn't matter which of the frailty models they used. Uh, because they all predicted future death, uh, enabling flexibility and the approach use. So the quicker one might be easier and better to use. So uh, in Australia, the Australian government put money in to test the frail scale and see whether or not it would be useful in a clinical set in clinical setting. They've never really published this study, but the aged care minister, if he'd looked at the results, Ken Wyatt, uh, said uh, basically using the frailty uh, screen, which was the frail, is the canary in the coal mine. If you use it, you will pick up older people who are in trouble. It outlines a life-changing opportunity, describing frailty detection as a game changer in his mind. And he thought that basically you could reverse uh, frailty with safe, simple, inexpensive, practical interventions. Uh, so that was uh, the first uh, na national uh, belief that the frail scale was useful. Um, so what we did is we went on with the frail scale and we developed an algorithm for the management of frailty. And this is why it is very useful. Uh, and I'll show you some of the stuff at the end that we're doing with it. But if you're fatigued, you have to look for depression, but you also have to look for sleep apnea. The easiest way to look for it is just to ask them if their bed partner says they stop breathing while asleep, or you can go through, well, you're fatigued, what's going on with your sleeping and so on. You obviously got to look for hypothyroidism, B12 deficiency, check they're not anemic and that they don't have uh, hypotension or orthostasis. All of those uh, can be fixed if you pick it up as a fra uh, as as fatigue, I need to point out that in our studies we find 10 to 20 percent of people over the age of 65 have central sleep apnea, and it's a very common cause of fatigue and frailty. Resistance and aerobic sarcopenia. If they've got that, they should be doing a resistance and aerobic exercise three to five times a week and getting a protein supplement daily. If they have illnesses, that's a proxy for basically polypharmacy. Uh, many years ago, when I first came to St. Louis, we basically looked in the VA and we looked at people who were on over eight, eight uh, uh, medications and we brought half of them in to see us uh, in the geriatric program and the other half were treated by the general internists and the cardiologists and anybody else who was seeing them. And it turned out we reduced the medicines by about five medicines, and that reduced hospitalizations dramatically. It also reduced deaths, but they were not significant. And this sort of annoyed me. So I went to look at why our patients were not were all dying. And it turned out that the people who died 
all went back to the cardiologist and they all got put back on exactly the same medicines as we, cardiological medicines, we'd taken them off. And you could actually trace by phoning the relatives that they tended to die when they stood up quickly or they did a large amount of excessive exercise outside. So fundamentally, I felt that was the best justification for getting rid of medicines. And I still believe getting rid of medicines in older people is extremely important, even though we keep on finding more and more medicines that might help as you get older. Uh, loss of weight uh, here, we've developed the Meals on Wheels uh, mnemonic, which is medications, emotional depression, elder abuse or alcoholism, late life paranoia, swallowing problems, oral problems, nosocomial infections, uh, for especially H. pylori, wandering and other dementia-related problems, uh, the endocrine problems, hypothyroidism, hypercalcemia, hyperglycemia, hyperadrenalism, enteral problems here, we're thinking of celiac disease, eating problems where you can't, you have a tremor or something, you can't get the food to your mouth, uh, therapeutic diets, which should never exist in people over the age of 65, uh, low salt, low sugar, and cholesterol diets cause more problems than they were. And then stones, cholecystitis. And uh, when I was 60, I developed cholecystitis. I lost 70 pounds over seven weeks, predominantly because I didn't trust any surgeon to take my gallbladder out. So I kept on going back and forth. And in the end, my wife said to me, I don't care, I'm phoning any surgeon, you're going to have your gallbladder out because you'll be dead by the time you make up your mind. So all of these things are potentially treatable. I, by the way, put all the weight back on uh, after I'd had my gallbladder taken out. So I went back to being an obese uh, guy rather than a skinny guy. This is life. Okay. So Theo working with Rockwood has looked at frailty in multiple versions and done a meta-analysis. And what she showed was that if you exercise people who are frail, their functional and performance will improve, their walking speed will improve, their chair stand will improve, they'll be able to climb stairs better, they'll have better balance, they will be less depressed, and they will have less of a fear of falling. Uh, these, as she pointed out, are mostly very short studies three months, and she pointed out that you need 45 to 60 minutes three times a week. That's most probably longer than you really need. And for the uh, resistance exercises, you wanted 80% of one repetition maximum with three sets of eight. And again, most probably more than you need. We've looked at this in other settings. You don't need quite that much. Okay, so now let's look at the biochemistry of frailty. And before we get there, just remember the, that human beings are not the best living creatures. Uh, the bowhead whale lives to about 200 years and it has limited disease and almost no frailty because the moment it develops frailty, if you're living under the water, you tend to die fairly quickly. And they showed that the ERCC1 gene and the proliferating uh, uh, cell nuclear antigen gene were linked to DNA repair, and that seemed to be the reason that they had this increased cancer resistance, which is the reason they lived so long. The other thing to look at is environmental frailty, and here you see the polar bear got lost out in, on, on, on an ice uh, uh, float out in the ocean and couldn't get any food and became very frail. But when we look at the biochemistry, there's genetic instability, telomere attrition, epigenetic alterations, loss of proteostasis, deregulated nutrient sensing, mitochondrial dysfunction, cellular senescence, stem cells exhaustion, and altered intracellular communication. The point I'm trying to make here is there are many, many causes of frailty. There are many causes of aging. And any one of these can push you over to having a poor outcome. So if we want to look at muscle, your normal active muscle gets worse if you're inactive. And if you add aging to inactive activity, you finish up with loss of cells and sarcopenia. And basically, as we age, we're going to lose muscle, decrease strength, have decreased walking speed, decreased bone mineral density, decreased body weight, and increased SARC if uh, Gustavo Duque would tell you that you should be looking at osteosarcopenia, 
because the osteopenia is just as important. Don't totally agree with Gustavo, but I think it's worthwhile recognizing that that's possible. And uh, when we look at this, we have to realize that the majority of frailty is actually due to a big component of sarcopenia. And sarcopenia can be rapidly done in the clinical setting using the SARC F screen, which is strength. Uh, uh, you have difficulty lifting 10 pounds. You need help walking across the room. Can you rise from a chair? Can you climb stairs? And how many falls have you had recently? We know that with aging, old muscle shows fiber size heterogeneity and fiber grouping changes. Uh, and there is an increase in muscles uh, in, with myositis and heavy chain with aging and also with denervation. Aging is similar, but not exactly the same as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Uh, important to recognize that with aging and particularly with sarcopenia, a large percentage, maybe a 30 to 40% of people who are developing sarcopenia have problems in their motor unit number index. In other words, they have a neuropathy, which is the reason for their sarcopenia. Uh, if we look at the pro protein muscle biomarkers that change with aging, creatinine kinase basically goes down with aging, aldolase goes down, coenzyme Q goes down, MLC1 goes down, uh, creatine, uh, myoglobin goes down, uh, uh, goes up, uh, cre creatinine uh, and the ratio to cystatin C goes down, and N-terminal pro propeptide 3 collagen chain. So that one can be increased by giving back testosterone. So what you're looking when you look at this is realizing lots of changes in muscle. Each of them are small, and it's a combination that causes your sarcopenia. And in addition, here we're looking at measuring C agrin. Uh, agrin uh, is an important uh, protein for structure and function of the neuromuscular junction. And again, you can see here that in people with sarcopenia, about a third of them have elevated C agrin, suggesting that their major problem is a problem with how their nerves are functioning. So then we have to look at fatigue. And Henry David Thoreau said, methinks that the moment my legs uh, begin uh, uh, to move, my thoughts begin to flow. And I think it's important to recognize that there's a big connection between the brain and also our movement. Uh, when we look at the brain, many things change with aging and they all put together come to fatigue. But fatigue is actually present, produced as much by all the changes that occur in the periphery, particularly in muscle, the changes in insulin growth factor, the brain-derived nerve growth factor, cathepsin B, fibroblast growth factor 1, irisin, and most importantly, the increase in tryptophan, which has changed to serotonin, producing fatigue in the brain. In addition to that, uh, we know that both uh, cardiac and the skeletal muscle increase troponin T, which occurs with aging, and this is related often to a decreased blood flow to the brain, causing fatigue. And if your lungs aren't working so well, you have a low PO2 also leading to fatigue. So multiple factors working together leading to the fatigue that occurs in frailty. As in Cool Hand Luke, Luke movie, uh, the answer is what we have here is a failure to communicate. Um, an important piece of frailty is inflammatory cytokines. And a number of years ago, we showed that basically both interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor receptor 1 and CRP are all related to developing frail in older people. Much higher levels development with the tumor necrosis factor receptor 1. And it's better if you're measuring receptors than if you're measuring the cytokines themselves because they just pop up and down all the time. Uh, recently, with Andy, Andy Wynn joined our laboratory, and he has got a fetish about progranulin as being very important. And so we decided we would look at progranulin with frailty. And what we found in basically the frail index, in the uh, freed index, and in the frail, all three of them 
progranulin goes up and is an excellent marker for frailty. It turns out that it's an excellent marker for frailty because it's an excellent marker for inflammatory cytokines. So this is how that works. So then the next thing that can cause frailty are hormonal changes. We've done a number of studies with testosterone and frailty, but DHEA, particularly in women, is associated with frailty. The decline in I IGF-1 uh, is associated with muscle changes and frailty. And very low levels of vitamin D, 25-hydroxy vitamin D, are associated. You have to be careful. There is a large literature that says if your vitamin D is sort of almost anywhere, you need more vitamin D. That data is nonsense. Uh, we've recently measured bioavailable vitamin D in, uh, uh, with the National University of Singapore and Rich Merchant, and we showed your values have to be low. If you use something like bioavailable uh, uh, testosterone uh, or vitamin D, you're going to have to recognize that vitamin D is bound to things, and you only get very low levels in people who have dark skin. So if you happen to be very white, it's okay to use the measurements we use. But all the other measurements, you have to correct for what the color and the hue of your skin is. Uh, there's a lot of studies suggesting that mesenchymal stem cells, uh, circulating osteoprogenesis cells, lamin A, which is produced by them, uh, are related to low levels in frailty, most probably associated with muscle and bone cell loss. Um, so now we have to look at what else have we got to produce frailty? Well, the advanced glycation end products are excellent ways to produce frailty, and people with diabetes are more likely to be frail than people who aren't. Uh, the age uh, uh, substances uh, bind to the receptor for age, which leads to vast generation, inflammation, metabolic and structural defects. And you can see there that this all leads to a variety of the things that occur with aging. And in addition, age causes cross-linking of proteins, uh, which alters their function. Uh, here we're just showing you, uh, this is starting to look right down at the genetic levels. And the only point I want you to take away from this, uh, a beautiful study showing that large, large numbers of proteins can and their messenger RNAs are related to frailty. I, I like to point this out always because if you look under the neuronal piece, they've got progranulin in there. And this came out about the same time as we were showing progranulin actually was related to frailty in humans. But obviously cytoskeleton and hormone problems, other substances, uh, inflammation, mitochondrial and apoptosis and cal calcium homeostasis and fibrosis all can produce frailty. So frailty has many, many things that are causing it, and it's important for us to realize that. And then just to make life worse, we now know that we have uh, miRNAs, and since it's exciting, uh, the microRNAs, and these microRNAs play a role in the pathophysiology of frailty. Uh, you know, uh, MicroRNAs play a major role in the epigenetic control of aging and frailty, uh, and they are also alter, altered and regulate muscle and mitochondrial impairment and frailty. Uh, it's a multi-system biomarker of frailty. So again, many, many things cause frailty. So let's start trying to pull this all together. Physical frailty is an important me medical system. Uh, uh, people are defined as physical frailty when they have a me medical sy uh, syndrome with multi-system causes and contributors that is uh, characterized by diminished strength and endurance and re reduced physiological function that increases an individual's vulnerability for developing increased dependency and or death. And the recommendations from IAGG, and these are similar to the ones that Jorge and his colleagues put out recently as well, but this was the original set of recommendations from IAGG, where that physical frailty can potentially be prevented or treated with specific modalities such as exercise, protein calorie malnutrition, vitamin D, and reduction of polypharmacy. So I think it's important 
to recognize this is a treatable condition. Uh, I couldn't resist putting this in. Perhaps the mo most modern ideal cause of frailty is fundamentally COVID. COVID has multiple problems that when you get really sick, you finish up being on a ventilator for a while. And when you come out in the end, you're going to have had muscle wasting with cachexia and sarcopenia, and you're going to have falls. And basically you're going to be anorectic and lose weight and all these other things that go together. And we have to recognize that most importantly, a number of people are better within three months, but another subset are sick for eight to 12 months afterwards. This is a little bit like when I was young and a resident, we used to see people with infectious mononucleosis who didn't get better. So it's a viral condition and it leaves you with this long COVID, uh, can be diagnosed with any three symptoms of uh, there, but myalgias, falls, joint pains would be three symptoms. And it's present in its full-blown extent at about 5%, but about 45% of people who have COVID actually as up to about six months to a year still have some of these symptoms and uh, the loss of taste and smell are very common as you get older. So let's start bringing this even closer together now. Frailty is objectively defined and can be treated and can be simply screened for in the clinic by frail and weak because we came up with it like it. It's important to realize that there may be a need to look at social scales as well for psychosocial frailty, which is not always the same as physical frailty. Johanna Cross there, uh, where she came uh, from Europe to, uh, to the United States to show off what she can do uh, as a gymnast at 87 years of age. So this is resilience in its absolute sense not frailty. So somewhere between resilience, you get to frailty. Uh, this is the latest study, and I need to present this because frailty, physical frailty, often it coexists with depression and with cognitive frailty. And particularly if you have um, had atherosclerotic disease, you're liable to have worse cognition, worse executive function, depression falls and balance disturbances, urge incontinence, function that can decline and disability. I think best shown uh, in the latest study, but this is cognitive frailty. And we have to recognize you need to screen, screen people with physical frailty, also for depression and also for cognitive defects. Uh, so what do you do uh, to fix people who've had things uh, that are frail? Uh, if you look at them and if they have some problems in cognition, we've shown in Perry County, which is about 100 kilometers uh, south of um, St. Louis, that if you do cognitive stimulation therapy, you will improve their mental status, you'll decrease their depression, you'll improve their quality of life, and you'll improve uh, the, uh, their exercise function. So. Basically, we need to put exercise together in most people with treatment for depression and some treatment for what might be some of the cognitive problems that they're having. It's just the frailty cascade as we're wrap wrapping up. I've been talking about physical frailty. That's the biological one with genetics, muscle, hormones, cytokines, disease, and the deficits uh, leading to frailty social, environmental, income, support systems, health literacy, and activity. This is why we studied people aged 50 to 65 in the inner city in St. Louis, because we could show that with these poor social characteristics, they became physically frail much earlier than people with good physical characteristics. And then the psychological things that lead to frailty, depression, cognition, anxiety, fear of falling, fatigue, and health perception. If you're frail, you're going to go on to get functional deficits and IADLs and ADLs, hospitalization, nursing homes, and death. So together with uh, Rishma Merchant in, uh, at the National University of Singapore, we put together an iPad version to screen for frailty, sarcopenia, uh, anorexia of aging, and uh, cognitive problems, as well as a general feeling of where the person is. 
and she looked at over 2,000 people and published that study, that study in PLOS. And we have been working on a computerized version called the Aging Successfully version because we know that as we are getting older, frailty and these other problems occur rapidly. There are a limited number of geriatricians. They often have preventable geriatric syndromes. And we know that the government in the United States pays for an annual wellness visit. It's only done in 20%. So we've developed a computerized version for the annual wellness visit on the background of telehealth. So that takes out the fixed cost of doctor's office visits and takes away the need for the doctor's visit to do it. And the way to look at it is if you want to look at the beginnings of motor, motor vehicles, that was the Model T Ford. That's like our epic uh, uh, that we deal with at the moment, a great for, for billing people and not very good for almost anything else. Uh, the digital health is making diagnosis and coming up with treatment uh, which is what we've done with our computer program. And then special products such as telehealth for cognitive stimulation therapy, exercise therapy. And these are the things that need to be inter done. The intervention happens needs to happen early. As soon as the person becomes frail, you shouldn't be waiting until the person is functionally impaired. And that's really, I think, the secret of frailty. It's the primary prevention of going on to disability. This is just showing you our rapid geriatric assessment with all the things that get measured on our computer program. And then it gives an answer to the healthcare professional. Your patient is frail, your patient's uh, depressed, has hearing deficits. And it will also then give for each of these what therapeutic interventions should be used. So as we finish, I'd like to point out to you that when you start out as a baby, you're frail, you can't do much. As you get older, you do better and better. Somewhere around about 30, you peak out. And then after that, you sort of struggle a little bit to around about 60, 65, then you slow down and eventually you become frail. And if nothing is done about it, you develop disability before you die. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Marley. Thank you for a great presentation. I'm gonna turn on my cell phone. And now uh, for the audience, you are, you are able to ask questions by using your Q&A button uh, in your Zoom toolbar. So you can see there uh, closer to, to all your uh, buttons, including the share screen and polls and others. So, and I have few, a few questions I'm gonna be asking uh, Dr. Morley in a minute. So. Uh, the second thing says, please complete your uh, post uh, presentation survey that is going to come to you at the end of the of this presentation. So, okay, I have a few questions here, and and the first two are somehow related, but uh, and, and and related to the issue of polypharmacy and frailty. From Carrie's guest is we have long term care residents on. 20 or more medications, many of them vitamins, supplements, nutraceuticals. How can we better advocate for eliminating some of this? And maybe, and I can follow up with the other one that is also related, it's with regards to concerns of polypharmacy, can you comment on the potential impact of this use of sedatives in older patients with friends? Okay, so uh, I'll give you the example of the first person I saw at the VA. So this was many years ago who came in, was referred, who had been in a cardiology clinic. He came in on 26 medicines. And I looked at him and I, I we'd chosen him because he had the most medicines of anyone at the VA. Uh, so basically he came in and I said to him, how do you remember to take these every day? And he said, oh, I don't. I take them when I need them. So I thought, well, okay, I'll choose the ones he has to take every day and we'll find out those and we can get all of those that he takes when he needs them and tell him not to take them anymore. So I said, what about this one, digoxin? Uh, you take that every day, don't you? He said, 
No, Dr. Morley, I only take that when I really need it. I said, oh, and what do you use it for? He says, it gives me great diarrhea when I need my diarrhea, and that works very well. And so we went through all of them, and it turned out he wasn't taking any of them properly. He left on one medicine, and he basically had been very frail, almost disabled. And six months later, he came back. He was walking around telling me how functional he was, and he wasn't taking any medicine. So the first thing is to ask people, are they taking the medicine properly? Do they know what they're taking them for? And why were they given them? You know, because people forget and people get put on a medicine for a week and they keep on taking it forever. The second thing is, there is almost no data to support the use of random vitamins to older people, whether we're talking about vitamin D, you've got to be below 20 nanogram per mole if you're white and below 10 nanogram per mole if you're not, don't have a white or very fair skin uh, to really need vitamin D. And then it works really well if you're really vitamin D deficient. The same thing's true with B12. You only need B12 if you're B12 deficient. You don't need it because it's good for you. You don't need four different kinds of vitamins, which on last Friday, I saw someone who was on four different vitamins. And I said to her, well, I can fix your polypharmacy easily because you don't need any of your vitamins. And she said, oh, you can't do that. I love my vitamins. They're my favorite things. You know? So let's accept that we've got to work through these things and recognize that you've got to look at what the person's symptoms are. Yes, it's not ideal to have a blood pressure around about 120, but if every time you stand up when your blood pressure is 120, you drop it to 80 over something and you fall, this is not the right way you should be. And most probably for many older, somewhat frail people, they do much better running their blood pressure between 130 to 140. It's the highly healthy people who get into the trials who can be around about 120. So you've got to look at each medicine and decide whether or not the person really needs it. And it takes time. I mean, uh, the patient I saw on uh, last Friday took us two hours in an interdisciplinary clinic. We run an interdisciplinary clinic and we spent two hours seeing the patient. She went home having carved her medicines from 13 to about seven. Uh, she was now in an exercise or going to go into an exercise program. Uh, basically, we were treating her anxiety, going to treat her anxiety with some psychological follow-up on uh, and telehealth. So there are lots of things you can do. Uh, do you need a sedative? Sometimes you need a sedative at night to help you sleep. Uh, in my experience, I like trazodone because it actually is a pretty good antidepressant. But if you don't want to use a really cheap drug, you can use metazapine or remeron to help people sleep because most people having sleeping problems are also somewhat depressed. And you need to look and work with it. And you need a lot of psychological support for older people, which nobody really pays for. So one of the problems we have is it's much easier to write a medicine than send people to get the help from the OT, the PT, uh, from, uh, from the psychologist and everybody else they need to do. In Perry County, we get all of this done. Perry County is a very small little place and uh, the social worker there decided that the doctors were trying to kill off their patients. She never told me this, but this was my assumption. And she decided if she put together an interprofessional team, she could actually solve all the problems. Then she came to me and said, will you support me doing this? And so, yes, we've had some wonderful studies showing <laughs> that you can do all of this if you get a very obnoxious social worker who tells everybody this is what they've got to do and the physicians are too scared not to listen to her. So it's really important that you have an interprofessional team and she's actually very nice. So please, if you happen to meet her, don't tell her I said she was obnoxious, you'll kill me. Thank you. It's another uh, question that I think uh, it relates to disability. So since disability can have different causes aside from physical performance decline and taking into account Dr. Fritz publication where with the diagram intersecting frailty, comorbidity and disability, can frailty instruments be applied to people with ADA limitations? Yeah, so we use, uh, we use four instruments 
in primary care. We use the frail, we use the SARCAF, we use basically uh, the SNAP, which looks for, the, uh, for people with uh, appetite problems who may have weight loss and need those fixing. And then we use the rapid cognitive screen, which was developed from the St. Louis uh, Mental Status Exam or SLUMS. Uh, and it should be used in the VA because it's free. And none of the others are free. Even if you use the marker, you're not supposed to use it anymore unless you've paid to go and get training from the Canadian. So ours is the only totally free mental status exam, and it belongs to the VA. So uh, I made sure I did that because uh, I basically I knew uh, Falstein very well, and he had told me that he would never charge anyone for the mini mental for the mini MMSC, the mini mental status exam. And then when he retired, he got a lawyer to go around and start charging everybody for it. So I figured that I I, I like Marshall very much. So I decided that when I was his age, I would decide I wanted more money too, and I would start charging for the slums. So I made sure the slums belonged to the VA, so that I could never charge for it. So using the rapid cognitive screen as part of the sums. So you can do those things. You've got to look at more. And if basically somebody's fatigued, you've got to look for depression. You've got to treat these things. And it's very important to look at the environment as well. And unfortunately, again, it's almost impossible. To, with the VA, you can fix some of the environment to some extent. But in the United States, we really don't have a lot of money to go into a poor area and fix the environment. And in our studies in the, the inner city in St. Louis, we've shown that if you turn a corner in a block and the houses suddenly become poor and there's lots of rubble in, on the pavement, people become very poorly functional. So there are a lot of things to look at. We then, if people are frail, we may look at the ADL, IADL if they're very frail, but we don't start there. We start by trying to do these other things and starting early. And the whole secret is to get people early because you can delay the development of disability in almost everybody we've treated when we can get them into programs. But the problem in the United States is we waste huge amounts of money on medicine, in my opinion, but we don't put much money into trying to help people where we can do things that require human beings to help them. So that's where I am as an old person. So any day now, I'm most probably needing help from somebody and I'm going to have to pay for it myself. And I really object to the fact that the government won't pay for me to get this help. Okay. Another question for Dr. Gutierrez in Mexico. What do you think about the clinical meaning of biological age? I guess very related to frailty measurements such as pheno age. And how do you think they relate to frailty? Such of what kind of age, sorry? Pheno, pheno age, I can let Dr. Gutierrez ask that uh, issue. It's, it's, I guess it's a type of biological measurement. Yeah, we've done, <laughs> Luis, we have done many, many biological measurements. Uh, we, I showed you our progranulin, but we have tons of measurements. I think it's nice if you can measure bi uh, things uh, biologically because it's very helpful and it makes me feel good as a biochemist and everything. But I will tell you that on the whole, what we found is if we use the good clin clinical approaches that can be done quickly and we treat those, we get the other stuff better. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't a place to do precision medicine. And in the end, we should be doing precision medicine on everybody. And we should be measuring all the different factors and knowing enough to change them and fix them. The problem at the moment is there are not many things we can fix. I'm, as Luis knows, I've spent years using testosterone. It was as an endocrinologist, that was my field, was working with testosterone. Testosterone works in old people who are frail, old men. It works very well, but just as well as exercise. It doesn't work any better than exercise. So ex if I have a choice, I should have the people doing exercise. But that means I've got to have an exercise group. I've got to make it fun. I've got to pay people to do that. And 
in the States, they'd have to pay to come and get their exercise, and people stop paying. They'll pay for a drug. So I, I would find it much easier to give somebody testosterone and tell them to go and do an exercise program. So the biological answers are there. We're going to do much better, and I think it's important to measure them. And Luis is in a large center, you know, the, the major center in Mexico for doing stuff and learning stuff. So it's right to measure them. But I think we first got to make sure that we do the things that we can fix that are simple and easy. So, and, and this, I've come a long way. You know, when I started geriatrics coming from endocrinology, I just wanted to give endocrine products to old people and make them better. I knew a lot about endocrinology. As I learned more about geriatrics, I stopped doing as much endocrinology. It was amazing to me how the endocrinology sort of disappeared over that time. Thank you. Uh, Does that help, Luis? I see he's now in the, this, this room, so he could actually say something if he yes, wants he to. He can. I, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Oh, well, just, uh, well, I, I was wondering, <clears throat> in fact, uh, the idea is just going in uh, the way of precision medicine, but you are absolutely right, John. It, it would be of uh, interest if we had something to propose uh, before we, we have uh, specific interventions to develop, it will be uh, pointless. But uh, I, I believe that also in the interest of a better understanding of what lies behind and uh, to, in order to reach a more precise and universal definition of, of frailty, this, uh, this idea of, uh, of measurement biological age by, in fact, uh, simple uh, lab measurements, which is the case of Peno age, doesn't lack uh, interest. And, and we could, uh, what we do not know is if it uh, superposes with frailty. Yeah, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. And I showed somewhere along all the biochemical stuff and stuff. And I, I you know, I have two lives. My one life is a laboratory life where I do all of this stuff and we do tons of measurements and it's very exciting and I love it. And then I have another life where I see patients and I try to make them better. And that's very exciting and I love it. The two, you know, I think cytokines, inflammatory cytokines are one where really if we can find a good way to treat inflammatory cytokines, we will do very well. But remember things like alpha lipoic acid treat inflammatory cytokines, but unfortunately they wipe them out totally. And if you wipe inflammatory cytokines out totally, at least in animals, you kill the animal. You have to bring things back into the normal range. And it's very difficult to move stuff into the normal age range. You know, for cognition, we've shown beta amyloid enhances cognition at low physiological do doses. When you get up to the high doses, it causes Alzheimer's disease, but we've got people running around trying to give antibodies to get rid of the uh, uh, beta amyloid. And we showed 20 years ago that if you do that, at least in animals, the animals get a lot worse. So it's trying to find a way to fix the biochemistry appropriately, not just get rid of it. And I think it's very hard. I think it's exciting. I think it's the future for young people out there in geriatrics. But at the same time, we need to build a program doing what Larry Rubenstein showed you could do for the disabled, what we can do for preventive medicine for the frail and the pre-frail. Does that help, Luis? Thank you, yes, indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Morley. I think we ran out of time. There are a lot of questions that were left, but I will probably share them with Dr. Morley and see if we could answer them uh, after the conference, but in the interest of time and because uh, we we reach at the 1 p.m. I think we're going to end our presentation again, thanking uh, all the participants and especially again Dr. Morley for his kind participation in this excellent conference. Thank you again. Take care and please complete your service uh, post post uh, conference service. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Bye. Bye bye.